From year to year, month to month, week to week, and day to day, people across the world are obsessed with a phenomenon that is professional wrestling. But why? 101 Reasons to Love Professional Wrestling There are many components of professional wrestling that should be both understood and celebrated, in no particular order. History Wrestling has been around forever. Its origins are deep and has been around since ancient Greece, but we're not going to go that far back today. We're just going to go back about 200 years ago. So hop in your DeLorean, phone booth, TARDIS, or preferred time traveling vehicle because it's time to bump to the future. In the 1830s, the idea of combining wrestling and entertainment began in France. It was connected to the sideshow attraction worlds of circuses, traveling carnivals, and vaudeville. The traveling wrestling shows would continue to grow and be loved as a global art form and entertainment option. At this time, George Hackenschmidt, a thriving bodybuilder, began his illustrious and trailblazing career. He would carry his share of championships, but also fame and acclaim. Frank Gotch would become his biggest foe. In 1911, the two would face off at the new Comiskey Park in Chicago and drew a very impressive 30,000 fans. However, the form of professional wrestling as we know it began in the 1920s when the reveal of matches being predetermined became more widely known. With the likes of Frank Gotch and Hackenschmidt both retiring, there just weren't any new stars at the time. This led to Ed Lewis, Billy Sandow, and Toots Mott joining forces to start their own promotion. This is where wrestling as we know it in modern day really took shape. The innovative trio would feature tag team wrestling, time limits, signature moves, and heel tactics like distracting the referee to add more theatrics to the existing art form. In 1948, the National Wrestling Alliance was born. The NWA was a group of independent companies that would unify their various world titles into one World Heavyweight Championship. In the 1940s and 50s, it would be Luthez to lead the company. Also in the 1950s, thanks to the invention of television, professional wrestling saw a resurgence in popularity. NWA would dominate for many years, but in 1960, Vern Gagne broke away from the alliance. He would rename his company the American Wrestling Association. Vince McMahon Sr. pulled his Capital Wrestling Corporation from the NWA in 1963. And you could say at that point, the territory wars were in full effect. The 70s were best summed up with three things. Bruno San Martino, Andre the Giant, and Georgia Championship Wrestling. Bruno San Martino would own the 60s while he held the WWWF Heavyweight Championship for 7 years, 8 months, and 1 day. That's 2,803 days. He would win it back in 73, but in a huge disappointment, he would only hold it this time for 3 years, 4 months, and 20 days. To say Bruno San Martino was a star would be an understatement. Meanwhile, another Hall of Famer was just getting started. Andre the Giant joined the WWWF in 1973. He would make the rounds through all the territories as the legend of the Giant truly began. Then in 1979, Georgia Championship Wrestling would become the first nationally broadcast wrestling show on Ted Turner's TBS network. Wrestling on cable? Who would have thought? But this is the same professional wrestling that was evolved through the carnival circuit. The carny tactics of trying to get over on someone was clearly at play. The politics between rival owners over using wrestlers over money and market dominance was very competitive at the time. Enter Vince McMahon Jr. He would take over the WWWF, buy national time slots, buy up territories, and become the leading brand in professional wrestling. The NWA saw struggles at the time and would become centered around Jim Crockett promotions. It would finally land on TV in the mid 80s, but it was a bit too late to catch up to the momentum that Vince McMahon Jr.'s WWF had created. A lot of that momentum is thanks to Hulk Hogan and WrestleMania. Hulk Hogan became an icon, while WrestleMania became a pastime. The Rock and Wrestling connection was a huge success to say the least. 
For many, the 80s was a great period in wrestling because of WWF's magic. The WWF had the immortal Hulk Hogan, the eighth wonder of the world Andre the Giant, Macho Man Randy Savage, and the Ultimate Warrior, all in singles competition, while their tag team division was stacked with the likes of the Hart Foundation, the British Bulldogs, and Demolition. Meanwhile, NWA had Nature Boy Ric Flair, the American Dream Dusty Rhodes, and Harley Race with a tag division stacked with the lights of Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Express, the Four Horsemen duos, and of course, the legendary Road Warriors. In the late 80s, Jim Crockett would tap out and sell his NWA territory, which at the time was the main one, to the TBS owner, Atlanta Braves owner, CNN owner, and Jane Fonda's husband, billionaire Ted himself, Ted Turner. In his first few years of ownership, he would go on to rename the promotion to World Championship Wrestling, WCW. In 1993, WCW would break away from NWA completely and start doing its own thing. And by doing its own thing, I mean hire all of WWF's biggest stars from the 80s. The WWF would still hold their own as number one, but not by much. While the legendary likes of The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, and Bret Hart were having some of the best feuds and rivalries of all time, the early to mid 90s were still a bit rough. WCW couldn't do much with WWF's former stars, but had established a strong undercard, and their homegrown main eventers were remarkable in the likes of Sting, Ric Flair, and The Giant. Which is not Andre, but in fact the future WWE star The Big Show, who was at the time being cast as Andre's alleged son. Recreating WWF's 80s in the 90s just didn't work. But WCW did not give up. It would be just a few years later and the next wave of WWF superstars to fall prey to Ted Turner's deep pocketbooks that changed the wave of things. WWF's Diesel, Razor Ramon, 123 Kid, and a few others would jump ship to WCW. This was all during the Monday Night Wars. WWF's Monday Night Raw and WCW's Monday Nitro were going head to head for ratings. When Razor and Diesel both showed up on Nitro, it created a gigantic, enormous, huge shift in the ratings. Then for 83 weeks, WCW would go on to dominate the ratings thanks to the New World Order. The NWO became a pop culture hit thanks to the bad guy version of Hulk Hogan, Hollywood Hogan, Ray's Ramon, who went by his real name of Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash, who was Diesel in WWF. WWF struck lightning with the rise of Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Mick Foley's Mankind, and everything just clicking at the same time. The wrestlers were pop culture icons, classic moments were created, and a lot of money was made. Then digging deeper on the East Coast was Extreme Championship Wrestling. At this time, ECW was the third most successful company in the States. Owned by Paul Heyman, Extreme Championship Wrestling was the little engine that could. Well, the little engine that could swing a chair, dive from a balcony, incite a riot, and show things you would not see anywhere else. ECW's hardcore style and a lot of what they did would quickly inspire WWF and WCW's products. And a good amount of ECW's top stars would leave for these companies bigger checkbook and much more exposure. In 2001, things really changed when WWF bought both competitors, WCW and ECW, becoming the juggernaut they are today. In 2002, the World Wildlife Foundation sued the World Wrestling Federation over the use of the initials WWF and they actually won. With that, they got the F out and rebranded as the WWE. The WWE would become a publicly traded company, go on to produce movies, and broke huge ground with their subscription service, the WWE Network. The 2000s also would see the rise of John Cena and Brock Lesnar as two true WWE icons, but the likes of Triple H, Edge, Batista, Kurt Angle, and Randy Orton also contributed to many historical moments and matches. The 2010s have been dominated by the likes of Daniel Bryan, AJ Styles, and Roman Reigns, while the WWE has seen its company grow to the likes never imagined. With no competition on a huge level, the WWE has been able to dominate the marketplace. Companies like Ring of Honor, TNA, 
impact or whatever they want to be called, have also put in the effort to compete. While these companies have had some outstanding talents, moments, and success in their own right, the WWE has reigned supreme. In 2019, the group of Cody Rhodes, the son of Dusty Rhodes, the Young Bucks, and Kenny Omega joined forces with Tony Khan, the son of a billionaire businessman, to launch All Elite Wrestling. AEW will look to compete with WWE as they bring pro wrestling back to Ted Turner's TNT network. As we head into a new decade, it is apparent that history repeats itself, even in professional wrestling. This is just a tiny taste of the history of professional wrestling in America. Japan, Mexico, the UK, and other parts of the world have their own stories as well. Folks on ESPN and in sports bars think it's impressive that they know the batting average of some third baseman from four years ago. It's all sports. It's baseball, basketball, hockey, football. Everyone knows the stats, history, and legacies. But do you know what's even more impressive? Knowing the name of all four members of the old biker gang stable, DOA, that's impressive. Knowing how many intercontinental title reigns Razor Ramon had is impressive. There have been many shows over many years with many memories, facts, stories, results, and moments that a true wrestling fan will always remember. You don't get much better than the history of professional wrestling.